right, uh, tonight, originally I was going to do a talk on um, the process of getting into the SES because um, obviously I passed in 84 and uh, my last two years spent in the regiment was with Training Wing, but it got uh, passed and uh, they want the talk on the escape from uh, Iraq. Um, I take it back to um, 1990, just prior to um, the invasion. Um, it'll, if I explain what was going on, it'll probably make sense as the story develops. Um, I was part of B Squadron. Now in the SES there's four squadrons. You've got A, B, D and G. There's a fifth squadron, but you have to be in one of the other squadrons before you can join that. Um, we have uh, all different roles. Every squadron is the same, but different, different roles for six months. So you'd have a standby squadron. Now this is a squadron that would go off to the, to the Far East or the Middle East if there was an incident. You've got the anti-terrorist team. Um, we have um, squadron training which the guys would then do squadron training, personal training, and troop training, and then team tasks. Now team tasks is where we send small groups of guys all around the world uh, and basically teach them how to use the weapons that we've sold them. Uh, so, uh, and then on that note, uh, there had been guys out in Iraq um, a, a, few, a few years earlier um, teaching them um, how to use some equipment, which will come apparent later on. Right, um, so I, I was on the anti-terrorist team. I was getting ready for an attempt on Everest, and um, up until this, up until uh, the invasion went into Kuwait, um, that's all my thoughts were on. And I'd been told um, B Squadron would stay on the anti-terrorist team right up until Christmas, and um, after that we'd go on to team tasks, where the guys would go off, and then I'd be sent off uh, on my expedition. It got to uh, December, and uh, we were brought into the squadron office, and uh, the plan had changed. And what was going to happen is half the squadron would go off and do team tasks, the other half would deploy out to the Middle East in support of A Squadron and D Squadron. Now, what that meant was A and D Squadron would get out there and start training and um, in prepping for a possible um, invasion. And then if any of them guys were injured during the, the, the conflict, uh, they would take individuals from B Squadron um, up there and basically <coughs> replace man for man. So we were just the poor cousins as half a squadron were sitting there twiddling our thumbs as the guys had all the equipment and they were prepping to, to, to deploy into uh, Iraq in half squadron formations. Behind the scenes, General de Billier and Norman Schwarzkopf were discussing uh, obviously several different options. Uh, de Villiers wanted to send the regiment in straight away in half squadron formations in vehicles uh, because he knew that basically, uh, once the regiment got in there, they could probably dominate uh, most of uh, Western uh, Iraq. Uh, de Billier, uh, sorry, uh, Schwarzkopf was against this. He'd seen a lot of uh, young Special Forces soldiers killed on unnecessary missions during Vietnam. And his idea was just get the B-52s across the jets and bomb, bomb the living daylights out of them, and then we'll just roll in with the armor and, uh, and take, take, take the land back. Um, it, it, uh, they brokered a deal where at this, at this point, I'm sure you can all remember the scuds that were going into Israel. There was a huge problem, or if this could develop into a huge problem, that um, if, Israeli, if the Israelis came into this conflict, it would complicate the whole, the whole thing going. So um, we were then, or we, the regiment was tasked to put three patrols into Iraq uh, to observe on uh, main supply routes. Uh, with the idea of we, we would, um, if a scud came down the road, we would call in uh, Coalition Fast Air. Um, they would then come in and take out that scud. <coughs> it was basically, um, it was a, everybody was rushing and everybody had their heads stuffed right between the legs and nobody was thinking. Um, and uh, it was actually pretty shameful because what I'm about to tell you in terms of the patrol and everything. There was nothing good came out of any of these three patrols. It was just people trying to get into a fight. It was, you can imagine, young schoolboys at school trying to go for a scrap. They were all rushing and tripping up to get there. We, we uh, got tasked to put in uh, this patrol. We opted not to take uh, vehicles because we didn't have any operational 110 vehicles. All we had is uh, Land Rover 90s, and they weren't a, a proper platform to put your heavy weapons on or your patrol weapons. Um, there was no armaments on there, they, they didn't even have long range capabilities. We were going to deploy um, some 200 kilometers in, in country um, via vehicle and uh, obviously two patrols via vehicle and one patrol by foot. Um, we were to um, dig underground and um, the observation post was, was to be there for 10 days. 
with the option of being resupplied or um, relocated or taken back out. As we started planning for this operation, um, it was very little intelligence coming back in. Um, nobody knew what the weather was going to be like, and nobody knew what the borders looked like, uh, nobody knew what the ground was like. Uh, our mapping dated back to 1944, believe it or not. Um, our satellite imagery um, was um, 15 years old, and we didn't have a specialist with us to read it, so in actual fact we were reading it upside down. So all the low points, we thought were high points, and vice versa. Um, so basically, as we were prepping, um, the only thing that we could come up with was dig underground, put some thermal sheeting on top, with vehicle cam net poles, um, get eyes on the road, and um, we would double up in, in two four-man patrols, one protecting the other uh, as they, they viewed the road. Um, as the planning was going on, we had one attempt to deploy into, uh, into country, and uh, that was aborted because of deconfliction de in terms of bombing. Uh, they were bombing an area that we had to fly under. So we came back. Um, and I can remember getting back off that helicopter thinking, oh, I hope they don't send us back out because this is going to end badly. Uh, now, our personal equipment, um, our, rucks, uh, our belt kit that you carry your magazines in, grenades and everything else, weighed in between uh, 40 to 45 pounds. Um, our, ruck, our rucksacks, which had all our medical packs, the radios, we had 17 radios, different types of radios, uh, in there, depending on what you're carrying, your rucksacks weighed in between 120 pounds to 150 pounds. Um, we had uh, two sandbags, which had extra rations in there, and NBC, NBC suits, because obviously there was a risk of a chemical attack, and each man had a jerry can, which weighs 45 pounds. And um, that's, uh, it's, it's obviously, that is an old, you're overweight, uh, you know, carrying that. Um, I can remember when uh, we, we went for the second attempt to uh, deploy in, putting the rucksack on, and basically two of my colleagues from the squadron had to basically lift you up once you got on, on your, you know, onto your feet. And then you just shuffled onto the back of the old Chinook and, and plopped down. We flew in, uh, we deployed uh, one of the patrols that were in, was in vehicles, they got off fine and uh, we carried on and uh, landed. We deployed out of the uh, heli and uh, basically there was uh, nothing, nobody came to see. Now one thing in the desert when you uh, land in a, in a Chinook and you've got them blades uh, flying above you, it starts to suck up a lot of uh, dust from the bottom. They, they hit the uh, rotor blades and it looks like a huge neon light above you, or two of them. So you're like, ah, hurry up and get lost. So he took off, uh, we lay there, and uh, as, as he disappeared and the noise, noise subsided, all we could hear is some dogs barking off uh, to our right, um, and which would be to our east. And uh, they just, they went quiet, and we, were, we seemed to be in a large wadi, and there was, um, there was the bank sides of the wadi was probably it was probably about 50 50 to um, 100 meters wide um, with a, a 15 foot bank so we got the guys up on the on the high ground with the guns and uh, started to do a, a map check now the idea was that we were going to walk up um, to find this uh, it was a bend in the road and uh, we would put the observation post in there first thing that we noticed that uh, was the weather it was freezing cold in actual fact, the, um, the temperatures never, uh, never rose above zero during the day and at night, and they were going to pro prove to be a big problem. Um, what we did is started to sherpa the equipment uh, backwards and forwards. A couple of guys would go up with some kit, drop it off, one guy would stay there, a couple would come back, pick it up, and we'd ferry this equipment until we came to a, 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 the dead end, a dead end wadi. And if you can imagine um, entering from, from the south here, moving up, and the wadi would end this back wall just behind you. Um, this side, is this this wall had a slight overhang, slightly, just maybe similar to that, uh, the roof there, and then your desert floor went off in that direction. Here there was a large flake of rock which had peeled off the side that was there, and this side sloped up gradually to the same height as that. Um, we got in there, we realised we couldn't uh, dig underground because it was flatbed rock. Um, so first light came, uh, we got on to, we got this satellite uh, um, comms up. The trouble with satellite comms, it leaves a big splash and it can be DF, like directional, directionally found. And uh, the Iraqis actually are very good at locating 
um, these because we sold them the equipment and we trained them. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes back to bite you. So, uh, so we, weren't, uh, we weren't too keen on using um, the satellite comms at this point. We also had a patrol radio which um, you send out a coded message and it's burst. It's a, it, it's con it's a message that's condensed down and it goes out in a, in a, in a few seconds sent there. Um, but we were having trouble um, connecting up um, back to base. In actual fact, what had happened, I'm fast forwarding here because obviously this is hindsight, the young signaller uh, who had worked out this, the area that we were going to operate in, um, he'd actually worked out um, frequencies for uh, working in Kuwait and we were now 300 miles north of that. So it would be like me having your house phone but with the wrong uh, city dialing code. You know, you can dial as much as you want, you ain't getting through. So uh, we had difficulty uh, getting, getting established on the comms. Um, <coughs> Roughly, we just spent all day trying to get through. That afternoon, um, we heard this young lad shouting, and he was in that direction, just over there, with a herd of goats, and he came up, and then moved them on to a truck, which picked them up, and then drove off. Uh, that night, uh, we went out and uh, to basically see where we were and uh, see what was surrounding us. Now, if you can imagine looking north in this direction, to our left and right, there was a large ridge line, which was a probably about 100, 150 feet in height. Um, some of the guys went up in that di direction, we went up in that direction. When we came back, we were all surprised everybody had found anti-aircraft positions. Now the Iraqis, their officers are great <coughs> desert tacticians, because again we had them at Sandhurst and we've taught them well. So we knew we were either in the wrong place, well we knew we were in the wrong place, we knew that in this area there would either be troops in reserve or we're next to a military installation. So it's only going to be a matter of time before we get caught. Uh, so again, uh, that first light, um, I, t I got out. Um, uh, there was a patrol signaler, but it, uh, he, uh, he was trying to get through on the burst. So what, what I did is I broke through onto the guard net on Morse code. And I'll tell you what it is. When they say, you know, like high tech wars, it always comes down to the basics. And there was it, it was just tapping away. And I had to s establish a communications on the guard net uh, back to Cyprus and I was talking to a signaler there saying uh, you know there's a high risk of compromise uh, we need uh, like a um, pickup or um, uh, a relocation um, nothing really happened um, that day except we started discussing where obviously all these anti-aircraft positions were and there was one on the top of the ridge line which ended say in that, in that direction there now that was going to be proved that would prove to be a problem somebody comes in from the south the only way we can go is straight towards that thing if we've got to come this way at some point we're going to expose ourselves to them um, and be in range of them um, the, uh, the young goat herder came back but this time he stood right above he shouted shouting and he stood right above the um, the uh, overhang now he either saw one of the lads or he saw some of our claymore mines that we had out. well we didn't have claymore mines uh, we had homemade claymores this was another thing um, Prior to, pack, prior to deploying, all our Claymore mines, which the SES rely on, which I'll explain what a Claymore mine is, first of all. It's a, a slab of explosives, which is shaped in that, that shape, and it's full of ball bearings. And what we can do is put a charge on that. Um, you can take out nearly you know, the contents of a football field. Now, if we were being chased up, we'd put one of these down, and we'd crack it off, and the fuse would burn down, and when the enemy are coming towards you, they get a face full of ball bearings, and it tends to slow them up. Um, <laughs> what we did somebody lost them all so we had to make them out of an ice cream carton with uh, ammunition and uh, plastic explosives so we had these out there um, and the kid either saw them or saw one of the guys he, he started shouting and then moved off uh, the next thing but at, that, at that point we were compromised so I got on the guard net and I'm definitely like sending away compromised compromised and I, I got a reply saying confirming that um, uh, the, the they knew that would be compromised. Uh, the next thing that happened, we heard a, a, a tracked vehicle, and this tracked vehicle was moving off. It was coming in from that direction, coming along. Now, as you, as infantiers or, or boots on the ground, the worst thing you can face is, is armor, because all you've got to do is put one shell up there, and it's good night Vienna uh, for all of us. And uh, we all cracked up our 66 ro uh, rocket uh, laws, uh, mini rocket launchers. Uh, which would have probably, if it was a tank, would have bounced off them because they're useless. Uh, so we opened the, uh, the the 66 up and we ate it, and we were sitting there. And I'll tell you what, 
You know what? I'm sure everybody's been in a frightening situation where you start laughing and you wonder why you start laughing. Well, we sat there and uh, I had a German, a German cap on because I'd been on my, my Alpine Guides course. Um, and one of the lads said something about Rommel and we just all started laughing. And we were laughing to the point of nearly wetting ourselves, uh, waiting for this track vehicle to come round the corner. Uh, I'm sure we'd stopped, we would have stopped laughing if it had a barrel on it. But uh, what it was, it was a bulldozer. And the guy had the blades up there and he was peering over the top. He stopped and then he reversed away and then moved off. Now, although in the desert, in the Wadi systems, there's no street signs, these lads know the place like the back of their hand. You know, they know, they know everywhere. So we knew straight away that this guy had come in he, uh, to check us out. He would have known that it was a dead end. So um, we started to get all the useless kit out of our Bergens, all the like thermal uh, sheeting and poles and anything that you really didn't need and ditching it behind this um, flake of rock. And uh, started drinking loads of water, uh, filling all our water bottles up out of the air, uh, jerry cans and ditching them. And then uh, suggested that we put our shamags on, cover our faces. There might be a chance of uh, bluffing our way out of this. So we started to move off and uh, I was in front and <coughs> kept really tight to this side of the wadi wall as I was mo moving down and the guys patrolled in, in a straight line. Just as we started to move out into the open, because I'm very aware of that anti-aircraft position up there, um, this side of the wadi, the, the wall actually rose quite steeply um, and then it opened up to about, five, about 500 metres in that direction and then the slope was more gradual, uh, and, uh, but slightly higher. Um, as we w came out the open, there was two old boys with AK-47s on. I'll say, I'll say they had uniforms on, just to, for legal. <laughs> Basically, they, had, they definitely had two AK-47s. Um, as they were walking, as we were walking in, I shouted up to the lads, we've got a close up here. We've got two guys, and uh, they're armed. And what happened is they just started following us on the high ground, looking down at us. As we got out into the open, we'd all bunched up, and uh, I thought, right, I'll, uh, I'll try the, uh, the double bluff. So I lifted my hand up and waved at them. At that point, he shot at me, so I'd obviously <laughs> done something wrong. Uh, we engaged them, and uh, they went down pretty quickly. Um, at the same time, two vehicles came up, and uh, more troops deployed out of the vehicles. 